Well, I want to begin by thanking all of you for being on this journey through the Gospel of Mark. We have put in, this is our ninth week, our eighth lesson, including the introduction, but we have been on a journey together through the Gospel of Mark. And if you recall, one of the questions that Mark is trying to answer throughout his Gospel is, who is this Jesus? Who is he? What kind of a Messiah is Jesus? So I hope we're beginning to have an understanding of that. This is our last time together. And this morning we're going to talk about the moment of Jesus' death, the moment on the cross uh, where he was crucified. And there were two big events that happened at the very moment of his death that I think are worth us spending some time examining. So we're going to start in Mark 15, verses 38 and 39. It says, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. So there are two things that really are happening in this moment. And the one was the tearing of the curtain. And the second was the response of this Roman soldier. And we're going to talk a little bit about those things in detail. But let's begin by looking at the fact that Jesus' death was different than anyone else's in human history. And the reason his death was different was because he was the son of God. Um, That makes his death unique. And the second reason is that his death finally and conclusively demonstrated that sin had been conquered, that God was in the process of conquering sin and death, uh, pain and evil, and he was doing that through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So this is a big moment. Um, So what happened at the moment of Jesus' death? There were two things that we've talked about. uh, The tearing of the curtain in the temple and also this response of the Roman uh, soldier who said that surely this man was the son of God. So he's stating his belief in Jesus as God's son. And what I want us to see here is that there were two things Um, that Jesus' death was addressing, that Mark kind of zooms in on. And the first was the temple curtain. And for the Jewish people, the temple curtain represented the separation of God's holiness from the sin of people. This temple curtain, it was actually a physical curtain that that set apart the holiest of holies, the most holy place in the temple. And only one person could go in there once a year, and that was the high priest. And the high priest would go through all these symbolic preparations that would get him ready to go into this holy place to make uh, sacrifice for the sins of all of the people. And so he had to get symbolically clean enough to go in and make the sacrifice to enter through this curtain. But all the people had to stand outside because of their sin. They would be killed instantly if they entered into God's presence without all of these special preparations. But it was this curtain that was torn from top to bottom at the moment of Jesus' death. And I kind of love that it was torn from the top to the bottom, just to make it clear that this was not a human thing, that this was something God was doing, and that that curtain emptied when it was broken, um, created a way for God's presence to be available to his people in a way that it hadn't been before. And that this happened at the moment when Jesus took his last breath. I just love all of the symbolism that's involved in that. And I think for the Jewish people, this would have been an indication that God was doing something new in the presence of his people. Um, He was addressing the issue of law and sin, and he was doing it through the death of his son. And then the second thing, with this Roman soldier having this reaction uh, to Jesus' death, and it helps us to get a little bit inside the mindset of a Roman citizen, and it would have been their view of the gods was that the gods used people like pawns or like tools. Um, You know, the gods didn't really care that much about human life. And the idea of God or of a God coming and dying and dying in such a painful way um, on behalf of his people, it just wouldn't have been any part of the Roman mindset. So the fact that this soldier had this response to Jesus' death, um, and remember that the Roman soldier, his job was witnessing crucifixions. It wasn't like this was the first one he'd ever seen. 
but there was something about the way that Jesus died that convinced him that this was God's son. And I believe that God gave him the ability to put those things together because it wasn't some, you know, anything that he would have figured out on his own. Um, so the Roman soldier recognized Jesus as the son of God. So these are two big things that are happening at the moment of Jesus' death. So let's talk about the suffering of Jesus. And I want us to see that everyone played a part in Jesus' suffering. First of all, Jesus was rejected by the Jews for blasphemy. So the Jews wanted Jesus to die because they believed that he was being offensive to God. Remember, Jesus had indicated that he was God's son. He had made that claim to be God himself. And the Jews instantly recognized this. Um, if it wasn't true, it was hugely offensive to make these claims. Um, so they wanted him crucified because they believed that he was committing blasphemy by claiming to be God. And the Romans wanted Jesus killed because they saw him as a political threat. Remember, he was claiming to be a king. And if he was a king, then he was in direct opposition to the Roman king. You can't have two kings at the same time. So the Romans thought that Jesus needed to die because he was claiming to be a king and he was a political threat. And the third thing is that Jesus was denied and abandoned by his followers. We looked at that last week about what that looked like. So his closest friends had abandoned him. Um, so he, Jesus, what I want us to see in all of this is that Jesus was suffering in many different ways. The Jews um, had rejected him. The Romans saw him as a threat. And his own friends had abandoned him in his moment of greatest need. So those were all elements of his suffering. But none of those things compared to the final one, which was that he was separated from God because of human sin. And I think sometimes when we talk about the cross, we tend to focus on the physical pain of that moment. And we think it was, you know, which it was, terribly painful. I don't want to belittle that. But Jesus' death on the cross was not unique in the sense that other people had died this horrible death, had experienced death on a cross. So Jesus' death um, was similar to other people's death, but it was unique in the sense that it caused him separation from God. And that's what I really want to zero in on, that on the moment of the cross, um, Jesus' greatest suffering came from experiencing separation from God. Jesus was God, so this gets us into some kind of difficult territory. It's difficult to understand. But Jesus had always lived in perfect relationship with his Father. But on the cross, because he was taking upon himself the guilt of all human sin, he, uh, God turned his face away from him, and it was something Jesus had never experienced. He'd always been in perfect communication with God, but on the cross, God had to shut that uh, communication off. And it was the first time Jesus had ever experienced what it was like to not be in perfect communion with his father. And I believe that was what caused him the greatest pain on the cross. That that pain, uh, pale, it just made every other form of suffering he was experiencing pale in comparison. That that was his greatest pain. But I also want us to see that Jesus experienced separation from God uh, because he wanted to address our sin finally and conclusively. And he did this so we could be restored into a relationship with God. That the tearing of the curtain, what that represented, um, Jesus wanted to make fact that we could now be restored into relationship with God. We didn't need to rely on one person going in once a year um, to make sacrifice for our sins, that Jesus was going to do it once for all time. He was going to take care of that problem so we could be restored. So let's look at that verse in context by reading Mark 15, 33 through 39. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the fact that Jesus makes this cry, I think, just underscores this experience of forsakenness that he's feeling for the first time in his experience. He's having that sense of separation from God, which all of us have always experienced that separation. But for Jesus, it was the first moment he ever felt that. <clears throat> 
excuse me, when some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone, and let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Okay, so that brings us to the Roman soldier's response. And I think it's important to note, we've kind of been talking about this, but something about this particular crucifixion was different. Remember, this soldier had seen a lot of crucifixions, but there was something about the way that Jesus died that set this apart for him. It was different. And also, weakness, suffering, and shame contradict every culture's view of divinity. So in other words, God should not suffer and die. Uh, for this Roman soldier, gods don't die, right? People die. Um, so this idea of a weak God or a suffering God that would be willing to die was so far outside of his understanding of what gods do. But somehow God gave him this perspective or this ability to recognize that Jesus was in fact God and he was dying for human sin. So there was something about that that was very clear to him. And the other thing that I think is really special about the Roman soldier's response is that he was a Gentile outsider, claiming faith in Jesus as God's son and that that was a result of God's revelation. And remember that Mark was writing this gospel for folks that were predominantly Gentile themselves. So they would have identified with this soldier. He was one of them. Um, and the fact that he was able to identify Jesus as God's son and that God gave him that special uh, wisdom to recognize it helped them understand that, that Jesus' death was relevant for them as well and that they were brought in um, to experience that belief themselves. Okay, so let's talk about why Jesus died. Why did Jesus die? What was the purpose of that? What was the point of that? Um, the first thing is that Jesus was sinless, that this, Jesus was capable of taking our place and to be our substitute because he was sinless. If he was dying for his own sin, it wouldn't matter for the rest of us. It wouldn't count. But the fact that Jesus was sinless meant that he was uniquely situated to take on everyone else's sin and to serve as a substitute for all of us. And I want us to see that Jesus took the punishment for every sin committed by every person throughout time. And I've heard this explained just visually, I think it's kind of interesting, uh, to picture like a giant funnel over the cross. You know, that in that moment when Jesus was positioned on the cross, he was carrying the weight or being funneled into all the sin of every human being throughout time, that, that his death took that place for all of us, uh, that he was doing that as our representative. And that Jesus' death makes it possible for human beings to be restored into relationship with God. So this is the ultimate purpose, right? This is why he went to the cross and did so willingly and knowing exactly what he was doing. Um, he did it so that we could be restored into the kind of relationship that he had always enjoyed with his father. He wanted us to have the opportunity to experience that. So he, his death makes it possible for us to experience that. Um, his death and resurrection conquered pain, evil, and death. And we've been talking about this as the major problem through the course of our study. Um, that all of us experience pain, evil, and death. And this is a problem that's universal for all of us. And the whole point of Jesus coming and experiencing life as a human and then dying in our place was to solve that problem, was to solve the problem of our sin, um, to claim victory over sin so that we could be restored into relationship with God. And so what God accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus was final victory over our sin. Jesus came to fix what is broken and to address our greatest need, which is our sin. Okay, so let's talk about your response to Jesus. If you remember back in week four, I went through and said that um, when we encounter Jesus, we will have a response to him, that a response is required. 
And back in week four, I kind of gave three different options. And I said that I wanted you to sort of think about where you are personally, um, how you're responding to Jesus. And I gave sort of three questions for you to figure out where you are. And the first question is, um, do you have more questions before you follow Jesus? So I gave the image of sort of a football game, and you could be on the sideline or in the stands watching, and you say, well, this is all interesting, but I'm not sure yet. I have some more questions. And I think that's a perfectly legitimate place to be. I think that's great. Um, but it's helpful for you to know if that's you, um, to be able to self-identify. Uh, am I in this position of standing on the sideline asking more questions? And then the second is, do you want to learn more about Jesus? So if you can picture yourself moving from the sideline onto the field. And I said, it's kind of like my daughter playing kickball. You may not have any idea what's going on in the game, but you're in it, right? You are saying, I'm going to step off the sideline. I'm going to step onto the field. I'm still figuring things out. I have questions, but I want to be in the game. I want to be a part of it. I want to get to the place where I understand it. Um, so that's sort of the second position. And the third is, are you ready to recognize Jesus as God's son and give up everything that might hold you back in order to follow him? And I said that this is the position of a disciple, or in the game analogy, it, it would be one of the players. So you're saying, I am all in, I'm going to set everything else aside, I'm no longer a spectator, I'm a player. I want to understand it. I still don't necessarily get everything, but I'm willing to follow the leader. I'm willing to be um, given plays to execute. I want to be in the game. Uh, so that is sort of the, the, the last stage. So I want you to think about yourself and examine your heart and think about where you are today. And my hope is that when I asked that question four weeks ago, and you kind of identified where you were, that maybe over the course of studying the Gospel of Mark and learning about Jesus, that maybe you've moved from that position four weeks ago to a new position today. Um, so I want you to think about that, examine your heart, and maybe when you go to your group time, um, talk about that if you've moved since week four, if you're in a new position, and also to ask yourself, what do I need in order to begin following Jesus? Where am I? What's holding me back? What do I still need to know before I'm willing to leave everything else behind in order to follow Jesus? And I want to remind us that encountering Jesus requires a response, um, that all of us will need to have a response at some point. Okay, and then I want to end by talking about our response. We've been talking about when Jesus came and in the beginning of Mark's gospel, Jesus said, the time promised by God has come at last, the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. So that was how Jesus opened his ministry. He said, the time is now. Uh, repent of your sins and believe the good news. And we've talked a little bit each week about what it means to repent and believe. So I want to end our time together by just revisiting these ideas and what it means to have a response to Jesus. It starts with repentance, which means agreeing with God about our brokenness and our need for forgiveness. And last week we used that image of the broken pottery and we talked about how it can't fix itself. Um, so repentance begins when we are just honest with ourselves and honest with God and we say, I can't do this on my own. I'm broken and I need help. I need forgiveness. Uh, and then the second step is believe. And Jesus calls us to believe. And he says, believe the good news um, that God sent Jesus to fix our greatest need. So when we believe, it means that we believe that what Jesus did on the cross uh, was powerful enough to solve our sin problem. We believe that what Jesus did on the cross achieves our forgiveness, and we agree with God that Jesus is necessary for our salvation. And then the third thing is live out your faith. Become a disciple of Jesus. Get in the game, even if you're still unsure of exactly what that looks like or what that means. Commit yourself to following Jesus um, and see where he leads. So thank you for being on this journey. I hope that you are getting excited about Jesus, that you have followed with us and asking those questions about who is Jesus, what kind of a Messiah is he, 
what did he do on the cross? Why does that matter? And I hope that at the end of all of those questions, you've discovered that God sent Jesus um, to solve our sin problem and to make it possible for us to be restored into a relationship with God the Father. So let me close us in prayer. Um, enjoy your time in your discussion groups. Lord Jesus, I am so thankful and so grateful for these people and for their hearts that are hungry for knowledge of you. I pray that you would meet them in that process, um, that you would give them guidance about what it means to be a, your disciple. Um, I pray that you would surround them with people who love you and love them and are willing to walk with them um, as they begin their journey with you. Just make it clear to them uh, what you want from them and just rush in with your love and restore them into relationship with you. In your name I pray, amen.